everybody. It's good to be with you. And uh, we are in week two in a sermon series out of John 6, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And today is where we hear that most clearly. Jesus has just fed the 5,000 and has sort of kind of gotten away from the crowd. And they have gone looking for him and are sort of chasing him around uh, like fans uh, who are looking for somebody famous. They're, they've gotten really excited, sort of like people showing up at a Taylor Swift concert, whether she's there or not, trying to find her. Uh, and um, that is the last time I will make a Taylor Swift reference in a sermon. So... Um, we hear that sort of fury of the crowd kind of going nuts over Jesus as the context for John 6, 24. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Really, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the whole world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Let's pray together. God, we confess that we are a people uh, who have needs and don't always know how to meet them. Help us to hear your words spoken to us just the way you spoke to them then. Would you speak to us now and may we find out that this is our story as well as theirs, as you offer this same thing to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus had just fed 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch. It is a miracle of generosity, uh, of abundance, and it has certainly got a bunch of people's attention. John calls it uh, this miraculous sign, uh, feeding a sign. It is a symbol of pointing to something other than just a free lunch. There's something more going on here. Jesus wants to meet their physical needs and he wants to meet their deepest spiritual longings and is offering both. He addresses their f- physical hunger and their spiritual longing for healing, for wholeness, for freedom. As is usual in John's gospel, there are lots of layers going on, multiple things happening at the same time. John makes the connection between this bread in the wilderness and the bread in the wilderness in the Exodus story, the manna that came down from heaven that provided for their ancestors and sustained them when God saved them from slavery in Egypt. For the people, there are clear echoes between Jesus and Moses, to say the least. Jesus has, Jesus has gotten people's attention. Surely this is the prophet that has come to save the world, they said. And the people get so worked up that they actually are about to rise up and demand revolution against their Roman overseers, forcing Jesus into a set of expectations as their king by force. And all of a sudden, just like that, there is this risk of what Jesus is doing kind of going off the rails. The people think they know what they need, but they don't really. They think they know what God's up to, but they don't fully understand. They get excited, but then that excitement gets shifted in the wrong direction. The people like us think they know what they need, but don't. And that is the dynamics of this story. That's sort of what we come into uh, pretty much uh, our own engagement with Jesus the same way. We have some sense of our need, but really aren't in touch with the, what's really going on inside of us. We're actually not real great at understanding what we truly need. And we're even worse, psychologists will tell us, in uh, discovering what it takes to meet those needs. We're bad at this on our own. So Jesus tries to help them understand. It's not Moses who gave you 
that bread or the ancestors, the bread in the wilderness. It is God, is my Father, who gives you that, but is also giving you something more. What Jesus is doing is trying to help them see that they're kind of looking at things this way, and he's trying to expand their vision to the fuller thing that God is doing. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven that gives life to the world, he says. And of course they say, well, give us this bread so that we can set up a Panera in the wilderness and have it every day for free. It makes me think of a story when I, was, I went to college. The first day, I, went to, I arrived on Sunday before classes started on Monday. I arrived and I met my roommate who was a soccer player, kind of got to know each other. They had just had soccer practice, so he said, hey, come with he invited me to dinner. Come with us. We're going to Fazoli's. And so I went to Fazoli's uh, with a, the whole soccer team. Hungry soccer young, young men, right? Who've just had practice. I have since had two boys myself and I understand you know, those I was one my, myself back then too. But these were hungry, hungry, hungry uh, young men. <coughs> young people, Fazoli's used to have this glorious thing that they no longer have, Right? The, the older folks, the <clears throat> back in our day folks, you know, kind of nodding our heads, yes, we know, they had someone that brought you all of the breadsticks that you wanted for free. And they just brought them out to you like a gift of heaven, like manna from heaven, like coming with this young, innocent girl who, you know, we had ordered our food, we've got pasta coming, and then there's the bread. Now, if you think that, you know, we could have a discussion about who has the bre best breadsticks, you know, there might be other restaurants, you know, that would remain nameless, Olive Garden, or Rhymes With, uh, or, or something like that. But if you thought that somebody had better breadsticks than Fazoli's, then obviously you would be wrong, because Fazoli's is, like, the best. So, like, we're not even discussing that. Here comes, like, to the co this hungry college students who've just had soccer practice, the basket of bread. And I realized college was going to be awesome when, with what happened next. My roommate, Tony, was the first she came to, and the lady said, do you want a breadstick? And he, he said one word, six. <laughs> that was his first go. Uh, he ate 30, I think, that day. <laughs> Who could fault a college kid for being hungry. And the same dynamic is at play here. Like, if, if you don't really get the story unless you understand that these are hungry people, not, be, not, not, not people who should think better about this. These are like people who are poor. They don't have food. They, they've just been fed. It's a miracle. And they think that God is really doing something here. And they're hungry. And it's that depth of their actual hunger, their real physical hunger, their actual hunger that helps the story make sense. They say, give us more because they're hungry. And Jesus says, take all of that hunger that you know about and let's translate that to a, the deepest hunger that is actually going on in you. Jesus answers them, I am the answer to that kind of longing, that kind of hunger. Now, this is not the only time in John's gospel when Jesus makes the connection between the two, between our real physical needs and our real spiritual needs. A few chapters before, he meets a Samaritan woman at a well. And she comes to draw water. It's another very basic need. And as she comes to the well, he strikes up a conversation with her, which is odd because these people don't talk to each other, Samaritans and Jews, men and women. And so she's shocked, and that's kind of the point. And then Jesus says, okay, if you knew who was asking you for a drink of water as he, as he asked her for a drink, you would have asked him to give you living water. You would have found, uh, figured out who I was. You would have asked for something more. And so that, that phrase, living water, helps us understand what Jesus says to those people in the wilderness. I am the bread of life. So here it is, that sort of, I'm starting to pick up on a theme, bread of life, living water. There's something about life here that Jesus wants to keep drilling down to, to point to the fuller life that we often fail to see because we're so focused on the needs right in front of us. Part of our issue with getting our needs met is that we get so focused on what we see and feel it so deeply or feel anxious about not having our needs met that we fail to see the bigger thing that God is doing. 
Now, it's helpful to know that there are actually two words for that life that Jesus is talking about in Greek. And uh, one of those words is bios, or it's where we get our word for biology. So biology life is, you know, cells and chromosomes and dissecting rats in eighth grade science class or something like that. It is the breaking down of nutrients to fuel our bodies and produce energy. That's biology life, bios life. And then there's the word that Jesus uses here. And here's the cool thing about the translation. It includes biology life, but it actually includes everything else too. So Jesus is not saying, like, don't worry about bread. It's not important. He gives the people food, right? But then he uses that very point of need to point to their fuller need. In other words, Jesus does not say to them, you want too much, right? What he's actually saying is, perhaps you want too little. And he's, he's trying to expand their vision from this to all that he had come to offer. And that word for life is zoe life. It's the fullness of life, the full spiritual dimension, not just the physical but the complete fulfillment, holistic life, all the pieces coming together. Our vision language at Broadway sets this hope and expectation for this kind of life in what we're doing together as the church, that we would be a life-giving community of growth where hurts are healed, where faith is restored, and where people come fully alive. Now, here's the thing about vision language. It's usually aspirational, right? We can always look around and say, yeah, is that really happening? Or we can keep setting that hope and that expectation, not give up on it, and begin to notice signs of it breaking forth among us, in us, in our own lives, and in our life together. Fully alive. Alive in every way. Alive in all of life. This is the thing that Jesus keeps drilling down to. It's what he means when he says he is the bread of life, or at the well, that he is the living water. But the woman misunderstands the same way the people who had gotten the free lunch misunderstood. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can we get this living water? And you can almost see her like putting it in air quotes, like this living water that you're talking about. Her skepticism, her uncertainty is part of the exchange. And Jesus answers, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I will give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And here we find the third way that the Gospels talk about life, biology life, zoe life, and eternal life which is the next dimension, which is what we expect life and life to the full when we would expect after we die, like the fullness of life that would be the life of eternity. And what Jesus keeps drilling down to is the expectation that he is not making us wait for that, but is bringing that into the reality that we experience today. Dallas Willard puts it this way, eternity is now in session. And so the people want to deal with their biological needs. Who could fault them? Jesus wants to give them what they really need, something that includes that and something also far more than they could have imagined. Jesus says to them in the wilderness, don't just get worked up about free breadsticks. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. There he says it again. Yes, we need our daily bread, but we also need every word that comes from the mouth of God. It seems like Jesus understood Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Put that up on the screen because let's go back to psychology class now in high school or college. There is that foundational stuff that we all have to have, right? Yet again, Jesus is not saying that is not important, that you want too much. He's saying that's important and that this is what you need and true safety is in the mix. Love and belonging to discover who we really are in the midst of all the messages about our identity. To live with meaning and pers- purpose and to meet our God-given potential. 
Compare that hierarchy of needs with the Exodus story that we keep hearing about in John 6. Their most immediate need at the bottom was for food, for safety in the wilderness. They, God gave them manna, which literally means what is it, as bread from heaven came down to sustain them. And as they did, they learned to trust God in all the other ways. They un- learned to understand that God was giving them manna not just to meet their physical needs, but to set them free in every way as a part of a journey where they would trust him and go along with him as he took them out of one identity and into another, one life and into the fullness of life that he wanted for them, to give them a purpose, which was to be those blessed, to be a blessing, to have that understanding that that's their engagement with the world, people of deep, daily trust in God so that they might be aware of what God is doing in the fullest sense. That bread in the wilderness at the bottom of the thing was really about what God was doing to expand their vision for their lives. But they didn't see the fuller picture, right? They keep getting worried as they encountered obstacles and they wondered if God could really be trusted. Maybe you can relate to that story. Maybe you kind of find yourself kind of stuck in seeing this and sort of trying to just make it through the day and wondering not just about food and water and shelter, but in some way about how to provide, how to get through and how to meet those hungers, those desires that are so human. Maybe you can also relate to the reality that we're actually not very good at understanding how to meet those needs, that we're pretty bad at doing that for ourselves. There's a video going around on the TikTok, and I say the TikTok so that you know that I'm cool and with it on this stuff. And I saw this on the TikTok because Pastor Laura showed it to me, and she's younger than I am, so there's that. Anyway, there are several versions of this little video script, and you've, maybe if you're with it too, maybe you've seen these where there's a script and somebody's sort of lip syncing a conversation, and it's actually the same person who says the thing and then answers the thing, and then kind of the video shot goes back and forth. Um, I'm getting cooler by the moment as I explain that to you. Uh, anyway, the title of this video says, If anyone can figure out why, why I am sad, let me know. And, uh, and then the conversation begins. The person says, I'm feeling really down these days, and I don't know why. And then the answer, or the questions, have you exercised today? No. Did you go outside? No. Did you talk to anybody? No. Did you eat well? No. Did you limit your scrolling time? No. Did you make plans? No. Did you drink enough water? No. It kind of goes on and on and on. And the video ends, no, yeah, it's really a mystery why you are feeling down right now. But we kind of all do this, right? We feel a certain way, and then we try to meet our own need in a certain way, and it doesn't really actually make sense when we step back from it. We kind of do the thing that makes it worse very often. This is the paradox of being human. We have these deep desires, these deep needs, and we're terrible at meeting our own needs. Let me make this personal. Recently, we have had a series of funerals, like three in three weeks. And as we, um, as a church staff, sort of, we kind of always live in this double s- space with funerals. I mean, we have a job to do, and it's our calling and our passion to help people in their grieving process. And then we get to know and love people, and when they pass away, then we have our own grieving process, and kind of both things are going on at the same time. And that's, that's fine and appropriate. We have our, all have our own work to do. But uh, so we had a funeral a couple weeks ago on Sunday, and Monday morning I walk in and I could see it on one of our staff uh, members' fa- face as they walk in the do- walked in the door. It was just like there's a weight on them. And I said, "How you doing?" And she said, "I just don't know why. I feel sort of just kind of down today." And what was funny about that statement was that I had the exact same experience with, experience with myself. Later, uh, the, on Sunday evening, uh, I had had the same thought. Like, why do I feel so worn down and tired and just kind of sad? Well, the most obvious answer to that question was that I was grieving too, right? That I had just done the funeral of somebody that I loved. But the odd thing about it was that I had to sort of talk myself through the process of understanding what I was feeling 
and why, what I needed in that moment, and how to meet that need. And then I saw it on somebody else's face, and we had the same conversation. Why is it that it wasn't just completely obvious what was going on with us? Maybe you can relate to that. It's, it's kind of funny, but many of us don't have that space where we sort of step back and say, what's really going on? What do I really need here? And then how does my faith, how does my spirituality help address that deep need inside of us? Here's one reason why I think we don't do that. Some of us were raised to say that those needs were bad. That desire itself was the problem. If you don't relate to this, you may not get what I'm saying, but if you grew up in a tradition where basically you were told not, just don't. Like, don't have needs. Don't be human. Don't feel those things. Just tamp it all down. Put a smile on your face. Faith means just pretending or finding a way to push through or fake it till you make it. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't have desires. But is that what Jesus says here? Or is he saying, actually get in touch with your deepest needs? The problem is not that you want too little. It's Probably uh, that you, that you don't that you you not that you I got that wrong so let me just back up it's not that you don't that you want too much it's that you want too little the problem is not desire itself the problem is what you're doing with what is really going on inside of you what you what you really <laughs> need the most what's really going on inside of us is a deep hunger that only God can fulfill. But how many of us have picked the wrong way to meet our most basic needs? We feel hungry, so what we do is we eat a whole bunch of hollow calories. Calories. We feel lonely, so we stay home and get more isolated. We feel lazy, so we skip the gym that day. We feel spiritually down or inadequate, so out of guilt, we don't do the spiritual practices that would pull us out of that. This helps us understand what sin is. Sin is simply trying to meet a legitimate need in an illegitimate way, right? It's not that we want too much, it's that we want too little. Whether that sin be selfishness or greed or lust or pride or envy or anger, it's a a way to meet a legitimate need in an illegitimate way. It's not too much desire, it's just misplaced desire. Very often it is our longing for connection and communion. It is our deep need for significance. And so so take any of our sins to their extreme and our drive for need fulfillment leads to addictions. And of course addictions are simply about meeting a legitimate need in an illegitimate way over and over and over again. And it just keeps not working. So we keep coming back to it. The dopamine hit doesn't give us as much as we wanted last time, so we eat more, or we do the thing more, or we act out more. I like to say addictions are like going to Chuck E. Cheese for the pizza. You know what I mean? Now, if you go to Chuck E. Cheese for the games, and you're having the time of your life, and you're four or 44, it works out. But if you go for the pizza, not to like throw sh- uh, and cast shade on uh, Chuck E. Cheese, But my experience of Chuck E. Cheese is the pizza's not that great. And so I I found myself going to, when our kids were little, and I eat a piece of pizza, I'm like, hmm, I feel unfulfilled. So let me have another. And then you eat the second piece, and it's like, now I feel bloated and unfulfilled. How? Let's try it again. So like third piece, fourth piece of pizza, and finally you just cash in your tickets and go away sad with a dinky toy. But isn't that addiction? Isn't that right? Trying to meet a legitimate need in an illegitimate way that just can never do the thing that it promises. Hmm. And left to our own, we will find ourselves there again and again. But Jesus calls us to want the thing that we really want. (laughs) To discover that we need the thing that we really need. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he is making an invitation to this greater awareness and to a one-on-one engagement with the source of every single need we have. He is pointing to a life of trust 
where we lower our anxiety, stop our swirl, and engage our world through the lens of God's abundant generosity. Dallas Willard, again, calls this a life without lack. Imagine waking every day and reminding ourselves that there is a source of all good things and finding the joy of discovering that it is true again and again. Willard thinks, actually, that the most radical words ever spoken are the opening lines of Psalm 23. Think about that. The most radical words of faith ever spoken. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Or to put it maybe as another translation does, the Lord is my shepherd, so I lack nothing. If I'm honest, I spend a lot of my time listing all the things that I lack, right? Like in a sense, I lack a little bit of everything. It is only a faith perspective that gets us in touch with the, the truer reality that there is a source that meets every one of our needs. What gets you in that headspace? What gets you in that heart space? Again, if I'm honest, if I were to have that TikTok conversation with myself, it might sometimes go like this. I feel anxious and overwhelmed and far from God and I don't know why. And so then I ask myself, did you take a deep breath and remind yourself of God's presence? No. Did you observe Sabbath rest and spend a whole day every week discovering that there is someone who made the world and it's not you? No. Did you pray not because you're supposed to, but because you get to connect with the source of your life? No. Did you indwell the story of scripture and find that it is your own? No. Did you list what you are grateful for? Did you talk about God's goodness with somebody else? Did you take some time to just do what you enjoy and connect with God? No. And then, yeah, it's a real mystery why you feel anxious and far from God. Let me remind you that you can't really guilt yourself into this meeting of your needs. You can't do it the way other people do it. You need the freedom to say, what, how do I enjoy God and how do I connect with him and Find that. Recently, I had a conversation with someone who said, you know, I really just, like, I needed to get away. And so I found uh, there's a river, uh, and um, I just kind of went and sat by the edge of the river, and I sat there for hours and just thought and journaled, and I just feel, felt really connected. And then they said, hey, Adam, do you want to do that? And I said, no, I want to go fishing in that river. Right? Like, it's okay to connect with God in the way that you connect with God. What gets you in the headspace and the heart space of that life without lack? That's the question for today. So that you can ramp up your desire for God. And so as we come to communion this morning, I want to read to us a paraphrase of that radical psalm of trust, Psalm 23. And as I do, I want you to answer that question for yourself. If you're going to do one thing this week that gets you into that headspace and heart space of a life without lack, what would it be? And answering that question is the first step, and then answering the second question is, like, are you going to do it? And you might say, well, this is like the start of school time. This is when it gets crazy. This is when it's all, like, going nuts. And, like, the, 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 the irony is that's exactly when you need this, probably. What is it that gets you in that headspace and heart space of a life without lack so that you can remember the words that I'm about to say? And then how will you do it? Would you hear these words of scripture? The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. In his green pastures I've eaten my fill, so I lie down. At his still waters my thirst is satisfied. He heals and reintegrates my broken depths in his eternal life so I can walk in paths of righteousness on his behalf. Even though I go through loss, hunger, disease, aging, death, I will fear no evil because, Jesus, you are with me. Your strong rod and protective staff put me at liberty. My cup runs over so I can be generous without ever running out. Surely this world is a perfectly safe place to be because I dwell and abide with God in the fullness of his life in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.